the cloud. Okay, fantastic. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to day four of Sabre Virtual. I'm your host for the day. I'm Jason Schwartz. I'm from Sabre Baseball Cards and also Chicago's Emma Roth chapter. We have an exciting program for you today. We'll be hearing from Jerry Amernick, John Thorne, Leslie Heafy, Michael Halpert, and Herb Krabenoff. Please know this session is being recorded and will be posted online on Sabre's YouTube channel afterward. I don't like saying this part, but it's part of what I'm getting paid to say. If you do not wish to be recorded, you're free to leave the meeting now and you can watch <laughs> it later on YouTube. Uh, in order for us to stay on time today, we'll be taking all questions in the Zoom chat function on the side of your screen. Type your questions in the chat window and the speakers will answer when their presentation's over. Thank you for joining us for Sabre Virtual. We hope you enjoy the show. Leading off today, I have Jerry Amernick. He's gonna be speaking on the impact of Babe Ruth beyond baseball. I'll tell you a little bit about him and then Jerry's just gonna jump right in. So Jerry Amernick is an author of many fiction and nonfiction books, and he's a member of the Hanlon's Point Sabre chapter in Toronto. His coming of age novel, Gift of the Bambino, about a young boy and his grandfather and how the two are bound by baseball and Babe Ruth led him on a journey of research into Ruth's life. In 2018, he published the nonfiction, Babe Ruth, A Superstar's Legacy. His new four-part podcast series, Babe Ruth, Master Marketer, was just released this year. So without further ado, Jerry, if you'd like to unmute yourself and start sharing your slides, it's all yeah. yours. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, great. Okay, so we're, we're in good shape. Okay, thanks very much, Jason, and thanks for doing this, and, and thank you for the opportunity to present at the conference. So let's go right into it. Uh, George F. Will is one of the top columnists in America, and he writes for the Washington Post, and he called this guy the first national superstar. 100 years after his birth, Hofstra University held a conference about him, and they said he's still a major influence on things intellectual, educational, and cultural. In 2012, a jersey that he wore sold at auction for $4.4 million a Guinness World Record. And just last summer, that record was broken when another of his jerseys sold for $5.64 million. In 2016, the Smithsonian in Washington held an exhibit of photos and artwork about him. They do this for people like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, and they did one on him. And the curator at the Smithsonian said, he's the most famous American name in the world. I'm talking about Babe Ruth. Now his impact, impact and legacy go far beyond baseball and sport. It involves history, culture, the arts, and business branding and marketing. In fact, Babe Ruth was a marketing machine who set the mold. Consider that he smothered America with his presence at a time when there were no computers, no internet, no social media, no iPhones, there wasn't even TV, but he made himself a legend. Now I'm going to tell you today about his impact and how he was a trendsetter and a visionary on many, in many fields. He used baseball as a springboard to reach the highest echelon in many different areas. He created a brand that has endured all these years and still generates recognition today. So what kind of brand does he have? Well, they called Gene Krupa the Babe Ruth of drummers. Warren Buffett still is the Babe Ruth of investors. Gordy Howe is known as the Babe Ruth of hockey and more recently, Tom Brady, the Babe Ruth of football. Babe Ruth means simply the best there is and that's a pretty good brand. Now, as Jason mentioned, I started uh, researching Ruth with my novel, Gift of the Bambino, which came out in 2004. It's about a boy and his grandfather and how they're bound by baseball and Babe Ruth. And then I added years of research into Ruth after that, which culminated in my nonfiction book, Babe Ruth and Superstar's Legacy, which came out two years ago. Now, Tom Stevens, Babe Ruth's grandson, uh, wrote the foreword to the book, and the book also includes people like Julie Ruth Stevens, Babe's daughter, who passed away last year at the age of 102. On the left here, you see a shot from the photos with Julia and Babe. This is after he retired. And on the right, this is 2008, the last game at Yankee Stadium. Uh, the house that Ruth built, Julie, was in her 90s. She threw out the first pitch, and that's her son, Tom, with her there. You go to Cooperstown at the Hall of Fame, Babe Ruth is still the top draw, no matter where you're going. If you go on the streets of Cooperstown, you see his likeness everywhere. You can buy t-shirts with his inspirational quotes across the top, like it's hard to beat a person who never gives up. That's the top seller. Or every strike brings me closer to the next home run. Preachers, evangelists, business leaders, politicians use his quotes to this very day. Now, Robert Ripley was a cartoonist, the guy who actually created Ripley's Believe It or Not. 
And his drawing of Ruth the Modern Colossus appeared in the New York Evening Post in 1922. Ruth was already the biggest name in baseball when he was with the Red Sox, but the impact really began in 1920 with the trade to the Yankees. And you had a perfect storm for building a legend. And let's look at that. First, the time, the dawn of the Roaring Twenties. There were new technologies like moving pictures and the transmission of the human voice. You had the emergence of national products like Coca-Cola, a huge rise in advertising expenditures, and this new phenomenon of consumption, products for people to consume. So in the, new, in the 1920s, a new kind of stardom emerged that combined personality with marketing and technology. And Babe Ruth made it work. He was everywhere, in movies and magazine covers in your face. Second part of the perfect storm, the city, New York City. At one time, New York had 18 daily newspapers and sports was taking up more space in them every day. This was also the place where people came to make their dreams come true. And third, this charismatic, larger-than-life personality, Babe Ruth, all these things came together and a legend was born. Now, Ruth's grandson, Tom Stevens, said Babe's personality was made for celebrity. Roger Angel, probably the most famous baseball writer around, he's going to be 100 in September, by the way, he called Babe Ruth the model for modern celebrity. I call Babe Ruth the master marketer, and in this way, as with many things, he was ahead of his time. He didn't have a formal education, but he was smart. He knew he wasn't just a baseball player, but a performer. And he recognized that baseball wasn't just a national pastime, but part of the fabric of America. He also knew something, knew something about marketing. In those days, there were only 16 teams in the majors. And he went on his famous barnstorming tours, bringing major league players to cities and towns that didn't have their own teams. The furthest west was St. Louis. So he was going across the country, spreading the product, spreading the brand, winning new converts. What happened? Well, baseball fined him and suspended him for barnstorming. Now, Ruth had help, especially from Christy Walsh. Walsh was a cartoonist and an advertising guy, but he was also a marketing genius. And in Babe Ruth, he saw something unique. He became his agent and what a team they were. Walsh ran a syndicate of writers, up to 34 writers at one time, who ghosted for athletes. Ruth, of course, was the biggest. Ruth was the first athlete to have an agent, the first athlete to have his own personal trainer, the first real pitch man from the world of sports and maybe from anywhere else. He endorsed everything. Now, Babe Ruth League Baseball, a not-for-profit baseball and softball organization. It got going in 1952 when Babe's widow, Claire, he had died in 1948, allowed them to change their name from the Little Bigger League to the Babe Ruth League, and of course, it took off. Today, it has a million players and two million volunteers. That's three million people. Mike Gibbons ran the Babe Ruth Museum in Baltimore for 37 years. It's in the very building where Ruth was born. And he may know more about Babe Ruth than anyone. He says if there was a Mount Rushmore of Americans, not just presidents, Babe Ruth would be on it. Museum opened in 1974. In 1976, 28 years after his death, Time Magazine put him on the cover. Why? Yankee Stadium had just been refurbished, and who else are you going to put on the roof with the fans coming below your feet? In 1983, the U.S. Postal Service put him on a stamp. In 1995, there was a three-day conference at Hofstra University, baseball in the Sultan of Swat, commemorating the 100th birthday of Babe Ruth, and I was at that conference. They had a physicist, a physicist who was doing a session analyzing the dynamics of Babe Ruth's swing. And one of the former home run hitters there was uh, Ralph Kiner. And they said, Mr. Kiner, if Ruth was playing today, how many homers do you think he would hit? Kiner said, ah, about 20. And the questioner said, is that all? And Kiner said, yeah, but you got to understand the guy would be 100 years old. In 1996, at Camden Yards in Baltimore, where the Orioles play, a 16-foot bronze statue sculpture of Babe Ruth was set up at Camden Yards. Uh, of course, he was from Baltimore. The sculptress, Susan Lurie, won the commission to do that. And she said that job uh, changed her life. 1998, the U.S. Postal Service put Babe Ruth on another stand. Now, what kind of impact did he have? Well, when Japanese troops stormed U.S. Marines in World War II in the Battle of the Pacific, their battle cry was, to hell with Babe Ruth. That's impact. A couple more things on the war. <clears throat> After Nazi Germany surrendered in 1945, but the Japanese kept fighting, the U.S. State Department actually considered making a recording of Ruth's voice to urge the Japanese to lay down their arms. In 1942, <clears throat> excuse me, Newspaper ads were taken out 
to condemn the persecution of Jews by Nazi Germany. The ad was signed by 50 prominent Americans of German ancestry, the biggest name on the list, George Herman Babe Ruth. In 2002, this statue of Ruth went up in Sendai City, Japan. Now he's widely revered to this day in many countries around the world, but especially Japan. And in 1934, he was with the American League, American League All-Stars that toured Japan. In the 18 games, he got 13 homers, was the MVP, and even managed the team. And that was in the waning days of his career. The statue was set up uh, where home plate stood in the baseball stadium in 1934. He had hit two home runs in that game. Now, one of the people I spoke to for my book was Ryazo Kato, former Japanese ambassador to the US, former commissioner of Nippon Professional Baseball, the big leagues in Japan. Kato said that Ruth laid the foundation for the game of baseball to become a significant part of Japan's national culture. And Mr. Kato later sent me a photo. I didn't realize it at the time. He's the middle and the young fellow on his left, of course, is Shohai Otani. He was 17 and he was the hitter of the year that, that year. In 2012, this is a jersey that sold for $4.4 million. Um, and I have two chapters in my book about the sports memorabilia industry, which today is a billion dollar industry and Ruth is far and away the number one commodity. David Kohler is president of SCP Auctions, the company that sold that jersey. And he told me that a former Secret Service agent was hired to transport it across the country to the buyer. And Kohler told the ex-agent to be careful with it, to which the guy said, hey, I protect the presidents. Kohler replied, presidents can be replaced, this jersey can't. In 2016, and then ended to 2017, the Smithsonian, it's the One Life series at the National Portrait Gallery um, in Washington that dedicates a gallery to the biography of a, of a person who had significant influence on America. People like Wink Lincoln, Washington, Martin Luther King, and Babe Ruth. In 2017, Norwegian Airlines put his face on the tail fins of their jets serving U.S. routes. They call it their American Heroes Program, and he was the first. Why? An executive said he inspired millions. Now, last year, Jeep used Babe Ruth in a commercial that stressed value. Also last year, the Yankees kicked off their 2019 season with a TV commercial showing pitcher Adam Ottavino, who made waves when he said he would have struck out Babe Ruth. So the Yankees put him in a commercial, a dreamlike commercial where he's back in the 20s facing Ruth, who of course hits it out of the park. Why does the name Babe Ruth still sell? Because consumers want safety, security, and sustainability when they buy something, and they want value. Ruth delivers on all that, which is why you see names like Mercedes, Nike, Sony, the list goes on and on and on. A couple of years ago, a Saturday morning, I'm looking at my paper and I see a full page ad of Babe Ruth. His finger called the shot. Next up, your prostate. They were encouraging men to have a prostate exam using the called shot home run as the angle here. And uh, I was amazed when I saw that. Notice it never even says Babe Ruth in the ad, but it doesn't have to. That ran in papers all over North America. Also that year, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom at the White House, which was presented to his grandson, Tom Stevens. Last June, 2019, Jersey, $5.64 million. And right up to the present day, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice, has been in the news quite a bit the last couple of years, and they made a T-shirt for her. And what else are they going to have on the top? Babe Ruth. Now let's talk a little bit about race. At various times, 10 different teams expressed interest in hiring Ruth as their manager, but it never happened. Babe's daughter, Julia, said he would have encouraged players to ask for more money. Maybe that's a reason. But the family also says he would have advocated hiring Black ball players. The fact is that Babe Ruth stood up to the owners on matters of race. He played with and against Black and Latino players as early as 1918, when he was still with the Red Sox and did that throughout his career, much to the chagrin of Major League Baseball, which of course was segregated. Baseball researcher Bill Jenkinson studied this issue more than anyone, and he believes the reason he never got to be a manager was Kennesaw Mountain Landis, the commissioner, who died in 1944, and he's been in the news the last couple of weeks. Jackie Robinson made his appearance in AAA ball in 46 and the majors in 47. Now, Josh Gibson was considered by many to be the best player in the old Negro leagues, but he never played in the bigs. This slide shows Babe Ruth in his Yankee uniform, Josh Gibson in his Homestead Grays uniform, and this is a cool story. There was a wedding. Brent Stevens, the great-grandson of Babe Ruth, was there, and he met 
Sean Gibson, the great grandson of Josh Gibson. They became friends, they commissioned a painting, and they sold limited edition prints of the two superstars sharing a field. Proceeds went to the not-for-profit Babe Ruth League and the not-for-profit Josh Gibson Foundation of Pittsburgh. Ruth was also a philanthropist who supported countless charities. He was the first celebrity philanthropist. In 2010, he was inducted into the World Sports Humanitarian Hall of Fame, and that's part of his legacy too. The Luminary Group in Indiana is a law firm that represents the Babe Ruth family and Babe Ruth estate for endorsements as they do with many other people. And today Ruth is their single biggest client. So what do people say about Babe Ruth? James Barber, curator at the Smithsonian, the most famous American name in the world. Joe Orlando, an executive in the sports collecting industry. There's Babe Ruth, then there's everyone else. Pete Enfield of the Luminary Group. From a licensing perspective for a sports legend, he's at the very top. Bill Jenkinson, whom I mentioned, we should recognize his greatest contribution to our common American heritage. It wasn't the baseball records, but his legacy of hope. George Will, the first national superstar. Roger Angel, the model for modern celebrity and Mike Gibbons of the museum. He was a cultural icon, not a sports icon. Now I'm gonna close with a short video on the podcast series we just we released called Babe Ruth Master Marketer, which has interviews with a lot of interesting people. It's available in all the major platforms and we also just launched a new podcast on how Babe Ruth beat a pandemic. So Jason, I'll uh, close this now and stop sharing and hopefully you can show the video. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to do my best. Uh, give me a sec here to pull it up. And, oops, let me uh, hold on here. Let's let's press pause. We'll uh, we'll we'll have it start just right. Okay. Uh, I believe now all I need to do is share screen and choose movies and TV for 200, Alex. Okay, let's see. All right, uh, can folks see a black screen that says Amernick video? Give me a thumbs up, Herman. Or a thumbs down, I suppose. Uh, let's see. Or Jerry, are you seeing the video screen? Yep, I see the black screen, yeah. Okay, fantastic. In that case, here we go. George F. Will is one of the top columnists in America. He writes for the Washington Post. And he called the guy I'm going to talk about today the first national superstar. A jersey that he once wore sold at auction for $4.4 million, a Guinness World Record. And that record was broken when another jersey that he wore sold for $5.64 million. The curator at the Smithsonian said he's the most famous American name in the world. I'm talking about Babe Ruth. Welcome to the show, Jerry Amernick. Jerry, great to have you on the show. Thank you for being with me. Hey, Babe Ruth fans. This is Brent Stevens from Babe Ruth Central. Today, I'm talking with Jerry Amernick. Today, you have reporters who cover, say, baseball, or they were cover a team like the Blue Jays or Yankees. They had reporters in those days. Their beat was Babe Ruth. He thinks even today, uh, Babe Ruth is the most recognized American name in the world. And this is a guy who's a historian. A historian and a scholar and not necessarily a sports guy. There are two categories. There's Babe Ruth and there's everyone else. Jerry, a hundred years later, he's still the biggest name in baseball. Yes. Ever. Yeah. Why? Babe Ruth was such an individual personality. What's amazing about his name and really his brand is that it holds up even today. He was really the original sports marketer. He recognized the value of his name and image and likeness. Daddy's name today is bigger, really, than it was back then. He created a brand that has stood the test of time and continues to generate recognition today, which is why companies like Sony, IBM, Nike, Citibank, Mercedes, and countless others use him to sell products. Any organization today that wants to build a name for itself, sell a product, or deliver a service can learn a lot from Babe Ruth. In the spring of 1918, the Spanish flu took hold and swept across the globe, killing tens of millions. Well, now we truly know what the word pandemic really means, don't we? But back in 1918, Babe Ruth beat a pandemic. And not once, but twice. 
his impact and legacy go far beyond baseball and sport. It involves history, culture, the arts, and most definitely business, branding, and marketing. In fact, Babe Ruth was a marketing machine who set the mold. When it was pointed out that he made more money than the president, he said, I had a better year. <laughs> what can we learn from him? A lot. Wow, fantastic. Jerry, if you wouldn't mind while I uh, feed you some questions. Yeah, from the sure. Department. Maybe you could put your video on as well and then uh, folks could see your face while you talk. Would that be okay? Okay. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. I got, I got Babe with me too. He, he showed up today. Yeah. Either you have the awesome Zoom background or you just have the awesome house. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, your video maybe half answered this a little bit, but uh, Ryan yeah. Shore wanted to know, could you talk about the podcast a little bit? Uh, what, what would somebody want to listen to that for? What, what interests would it be? Yeah, sure. It covers well, each of the four. In fact, there's now five. We did one about the pandemic. It has a, a bit of a different theme. Uh, we talk about the business side, sports memorabilia. We talk about the impact uh, of branding. We talk about members of the family. Uh, and there's a lot of people involved in the business of Babe Ruth. And I don't think they've ever been put together in this format before. So that, that's what we did with the series. And it's about master marketer. The, the focus is on branding and marketing and business. Uh, and that might be, you know, the biggest impact of Ruth. I mean, it's incredible when you think about it, but the guy really was a trendsetter. So that's what the focus is. Each of the podcasts runs anywhere from, say, 20 to 25 minutes. And uh, I think, uh, you know, if you take a listen, I think you'd find it very interesting. It's on all the major uh, platforms. Fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm in. Uh, and then it looks like Norm and Debbie Ginsburg uh made a comment many people still assume he named the candy bar uh tara krieger in the comments uh sheds a little bit of light but any candy bar information for us well the 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 baby ruth candy bar of course uh, th there was a big court case about that uh, in fact ruth never got anything out of that and there was a suit uh, they they uh, he sued and and lost it was in the early 30s because it was said um the company was uh the big a curtis candy company big, became the biggest candy company in the world with a baby Ruth candy bar. Essentially, they capitalized on Ruth's name uh, and said that it was named after the daughter of Grover Cleveland, whose name was Ruth. Uh, but later, Nestle's got involved and the family got involved, and, and that was the case. But initially, uh, the Ruth family didn't get anything out of that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Steve, Steve Ruddock maybe has some trivia. It's, it's a question, but he says, yeah. wasn't there an unfortunate statue of Ruth showing him as a righty? Oh, well, that, okay, the statue at Camden Yards, there's a story behind that. And I, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to get into it, but it's with Susan Lurie the, who put it together. And there's a reason why it, 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 there, it, it appears that he might be a ready, even though he's a lefty. And I, I'd be glad to go into the details about it. That's the 16 foot bronze sculpture of Ruth at Camden Yards, which is the biggest statue of Ruth anywhere in the world. It's called Babe's Dream. Okay, so we're, we're, we're gonna pre, uh, accept this session proposal for next year in Baltimore. We're looking Okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> uh, Steve wants to know, do any of Ruth's heirs, H-E-I-R-S, receive any money from the sale of Babe-related merchandise? Yeah, the Ruth family does. Uh, the Ruth estate uh, does, uh, as does the Babe Ruth League Baseball. They get a portion too. Uh, so yes, they do. And uh, the remarkable thing about Ruth is that, you know, with many icons, no matter where they're from, their star eventually wanes. Ruth's star has not waned. And I think you can argue that it keeps rising, which is incredible because the guy died in 1948. And this is what I think makes him so unique. Fantastic. Larry Lester has a question. He wants yep. to know, uh, did Ruth face any infield shifts like Ted Williams or maybe Ryan Howard? And then uh, even Steve Treater says uh, uh, Cy Williams too, maybe faced a shift. So any any evidence of Babe Ruth facing a shift? Well, that's a good question. I don't think shifts back then were what they are today. Uh, so, I mean, you can always make the argument he didn't face, you know, 100 mile an hour fastballs either. So I think you have to look at a guy, you know, at the uh, in the era in which he played. I, I think that applies to any sport. Um, so whether he faced shifts or not, uh, I don't think I'm an expert on that one, but, uh, like I say, shifts weren't used to the point that they are today. It's more of a chess match today and Perfect. starters, the starters, of course, and he was a starting pitcher. They would go, you know, 14 innings till the game was over. You're not going to see that anymore. 
Okay, we have hit the five minute mark, but the way you're you're rolling through these questions, we'll see what we can do here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, from Joshua Bernstein, more on the barnstorming tour. What do you think of the way Jane Levy used that in her recent book? Yeah, well, the the big fell. I thought it was a great book. She went into enormous detail, uh, and uh, she really focused on. I believe it was on the barnstorming barnstorming tour from 1927 which as we all know, was a fairly good team and a pretty big year for the Babe. They had uh, Gehrig and Ruth with their respective teams and, and she really focused on that tour. Christy Walsh, Walsh, who I mentioned, is quite prominent in that book as well. So I think she did a lot of great research and I, I read the book twice actually, I was quite taken with it. I thought it was a really good job and if you're interested in that kind of thing, I, I would recommend reading it. Yeah, she did a really good job. Fantastic. Uh, Robert Komorowski wants to know, uh, well, he says, we know that Ruth did movies. Did he ever do vaudeville like John McGraw and other players? Uh, in fact, I believe he did at one point. There was a play or something that he was involved with. And, and you know, when I do my longer presentations, I show commercials. And, and one of the things I show is a silent movie called Speedy from 1928. Uh, Harold Lloyd. And there's a scene where he picks up, this is a silent movie. He picks up Ruth and, and is driving him like a maniac through the streets of Manhattan. And just watching Ruth, he was a natural for the screen and on stage too. I mean, that's why photographers loved him. And I think that all added to his uh, luster as an icon. So many athletes, you see them in a commercial and they're so wooden and stiff. He was anything but that. Uh, he made movies, silent movies. And, you know, with, uh, with Gary Cooper, uh, the story about Lou Gehrig, he played himself in that movie in the 40s as well. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, let's see if I'm reading this right. George Robinson, he, he's not contradicting you. He yeah. makes it clear, but he, he suggests that Charlie Chaplin would have also had a level of celebrity, uh, maybe near Babe Ruth, at least for some, some amount of time. Oh, um, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, you can argue, uh, you know, I, th I think Ruth was probably the most recognized person in the 20s and 30s, and maybe in the 40s. And like I say, it was the curator at the Smithsonian, for God's sake, who told me he's the most famous American name in the world. And this is a guy with a PhD in history. So to me, that was quite significant coming from somebody like that. So yeah, Chaplin, of course, was great. But um, I would argue that the name Babe Ruth is probably even more widely known than Charlie Chaplin, with respect to Mr. Chaplin. Yeah, uh, more enduring, for sure. Uh, Robert also uh, asks, can you expand on Ruth and the 1918 pandemic? Yeah, well, um, tens of millions of people died. And in the spring, I think it was in May, Ruth was at a public beach and he caught the pandemic, the Spanish flu. And he was ill, he was hospitalized, and there were reports that he was even on his deathbed. This is when he was with the Red Sox, right? A star pitcher with the Red Sox in 1918. So he recovered, he went on and had a great year pitching and hitting home runs as well. And then the second wave, uh, he caught it again. The season was shortened that year and the World Series was held in September. And he started two games as a pitcher in the World Series and won them both, won by a shutout. And what I've read is that when he was pitching, in between innings, he had to rest lying flat down on the bench because he was so exhausted. And yet the guy won two games and led his team to the World Series. So like I say, he beat a pandemic twice. So I, I, the guy's inspirational. That's just phenomenal. Here's what I think we're going to do. Uh... As we are just about out of time, I think one I'm going to close with, it's from Tom. And Tom just wants to say, Jerry, wonderful presentation. Thank you. With appreciation and admiration. Great job. Exclamation mark. Exclamation mark. Exclamation <laughs> mark. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh -huh. It was a pleasure. Well, fantastic. Jerry, Jerry, way to kick this off. We've actually got more Babe Ruth content coming soon. And it looks like what, what I get to do now is to transition us to our second presentation. So uh, second, second batters on your marks, on deck hitters, I guess I can say, on your marks. Uh, and let's see, Jerry, if you want to mute yourself and right. video yourself, we can do that too. But thanks so much. And folks, I didn't get to all the questions, right? Um, but you can find Jerry in the Sabre directory and send him a message that way, and I'm sure he'd love to, to get more comments. Sure, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Okay, let me share my screen now once again. Uh, give me one second here, and I'll be introducing presenters as well. I'm, I'm a moderator for this one, so I'm going double duty. 
not to steal uh, Herman's thunder from his own presentation, by the way, he's got some double duty uh, coming at us. But uh, okay, give me one sec just to press the share screen. And I think this is hopefully, oh, no, that's the right one. Okay, fabulous. Well, let me introduce our panelists here. This is Half a Century in Half an Hour, Sabres 50 at 50 Project, starting with Leslie Heafy. Leslie was elected as Sabres Vice President in 2016, and she served on the Board of Directors since 2010. She's been a member of Sabres since 1989 and Chair of the Women in Baseball Committee since 1995. He's an associate professor of history at Kent State University at Stark and publishes in the area of the Negro Leagues and women's baseball. She was the 2014 winner of the Bob Davids Award, Sabres' highest honor. I would say, how could anybody top that? But I think we might have somebody uh, vying for at least a tie here. John Thorne was named as MLB's official historian by Commissioner Bud Selig in 2011, succeeding the late Jerome Holtzman. He was the 20, uh, pardon me, the 2006 recipient of the Bob Davids Award and the Henry Chadwick Award in 2013. He is the author and editor of numerous books, including most recently, Baseball in the Garden of Eden, The Secret History of the Early Game. What a pleasure and what an honor for me to introduce those two Sabre heavyweights. I'll spare my own bio, which would look puny in comparison. Uh, but I will tell you, here we are for Sabre 50 at 50. I just have one slide before we jump into what's mainly questions for John and Leslie. Uh, my one slide being, uh -huh, let's see, joke's on me, maybe, whoop, <laughs> I went too fast. Oh, well, uh, when I was planning for this panel, there was little out on Sabre 50 at 50, but it is now pre-sale, University of Nebraska Press and during this conference. 40% off. So uh, after, after you hang up today, you're going to want to check that out. Uh, let's do a quick audio check. John, can we hear you? Uh, here I am. How's that? That You sound perfect, loud and clear. Leslie, can we hear you? Hi, Jason. Hi, everybody. Hi, Leslie. Okay, and the camera, the green screen, everything. Okay, all others, if you can, please be on mute. That'll help us. Uh, but let's just kick it right off. I'm going to start with you, Leslie, and this is the obvious question. What is Sabre 50 at 50? Well, at first glance, obviously, it's a, it's a book. Um, but it's, to me, it represents um, what Sabre really is, because the articles that are included in this piece really highlight what Sabre is all about. But it also, to me, highlights what, um, what we've seen in, in baseball research, um, because it starts in the 1970s and works its way all the way forward. And so you get to see some of the progression in things that have interested people, things that have captured people's uh, imaginations, the way stats have changed. And so you get to see that evolution um, in terms of the game itself, how people have observed the game, how people have wanted to consume information, and it's all captured in one place. Oh, that's fantastic. John, anything to add? What's your spin on what is Saber 50 at 50? Well, following up on what Leslie said, we have an evolution even within Saber. In the uh, articles that uh, lead off the book, which are from the 70s and 80s, there is an, an emphasis on history, not so much sabermetrics, because Bob Davids, the editor of the Baseball Research Journal, wasn't approving of the analytics of the period and limited their appearance. So Pete Palmer, Dick Kramer, Bill James were put on a quota and oddly, some of the very best sabermetric stuff appears in the book from that period. Fantastic. Now, I like to throw some curveballs. So, John, I'm going to keep you on, and I'm going to say, what isn't Saber 50 at 50, if there's a way to answer that? What Saber 50 at 50 is not is a demographic menu uh, so that there's a certain number of articles by African Americans, a certain number of articles by Asians, by women, uh, by research committee. So Jason, as you know, the Baseball Cards Committee uh, got shut out. And uh, Dave this time, this time told me that the Minor Leagues Committee got shut out. Well, we, we as the four editors 
who were making the selections did not wear those glasses whereby we were trying to filter out a representative sampling of what Sabre is. We understood that Nebraska wanted to publish a book that a general reader might enjoy, get a general picture of what Sabre does, but readability was the key. Fan fantastic. And Leslie, how about you? Anything to add in terms of what the volume is not? Um, that was just simply to reiterate what John said. It's not meant to be a comprehensive in that sense. It, it doesn't capture everything. Um, and so it was also looked at as the idea that we wanted to look for things that made an impact. And so I think you can see that. Um, and so, but it wasn't meant to capture every first, every, you know, those kinds of things, which sometimes people are looking for. I, if, I, if I may add this, interpolate this, Jason and Leslie, we reviewed over 15,000 articles among the four of us, and we had to do some chronological splits. I took the period 1971 to 1990 or so. Leslie had her own decade, and so did Bill Nowlin, and so did Mark Armour. The reviewing process was extensive and intensive. And if your favorite article didn't make it into the book, well, there's always next time. <laughs> I will come back in 50 years and hold you to that uh, in the Saber 100 at 100. Uh, John, let me keep you on the, on the screen now for this. And I'm making a note to myself. I want you to take a picture of what's behind you. I'm going to use that for my Zoom background in future meetings because I like the look here. Um, so I'll tell you what, a lot of baseball fans, when they think Saber, they think, complicated stats and formulas. If they found a copy of 50 at 50, what else would they learn Saber does or Saber is about? Who's that question for? Uh, I'll start with you, John. Uh, because Saber has published so many groundbreaking works on how baseball was uh, integrated and how African Americans were blocked from the game and has issued so many variations in how the game integrated through Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey. Um, you've got all stars from Bill James to Keith Olbermann to Dick Kramer to Pete Palmer. I could go on and on. So um, our task was made more difficult by not being able to pick more than one story from a writer. Otherwise, this could have been the, the Bill James reader or the Pete Palmer reader. Um, so that was a restriction we placed on ourselves. The, the result, I think, for the average reader, who was not necessarily a 30-year Sabre member, as Leslie and I are, uh, I'm a 40-year member, um, the, the impression is of an organization that digs deep into baseball, loves the game, and loves all of the accoutrements of the game as much as the game itself. So whether the game is being played, whether it's on hold, whether it's the winter, uh, baseball is always between the ears of every Sabre member. Phenomenal. Leslie, anything you'd like to add to that? Just to say that I think what you find in this book it, uh, and what you would find about Sabre is that if you've got an interest in any aspect of the game, that's what Sabre is, because you can find somebody. And when you look at the articles that are in here, you get everything from the issues of stats, you get the questions about integration. There are discussions of women umpires. There's a discussion of movies. There's a discussion of novels. There are, so it's about the history, it's about the culture, it's about what happens on the field or what happens off the field. Um, the, presentation that just preceded this, right, was all about Babe Ruth's marketing, right, and so seeing that it's beyond just what happens on the field between the, between the white lines, um, and so I think that's well reflected in what you're going to find here, and that's what Sabre is all about. Yeah, pretty much anything baseball, anything baseball. Uh, let, let, me, let me keep you on. I think John alluded a little bit to the selection process, and it sounded like maybe there were, uh, there was a universe of 15,000 or so articles to, to whittle down to 50. Uh, give us a little more insight into the selection process. How did, how, did, how did that go? Was that collaborative? You got assigned maybe a, a period or a topic? Uh, give, give us some idea how, how that goes. How do you turn 15,000 into 50? 
Well, as John pointed out, it was quite it was quite an interesting task and a little daunting, I must admit, when I first started this, um, because there are when you there are well over 15, 20,000 articles. And we actually narrowed it down to a list that we all took a look at after we each had essentially, um, John took two decades, the rest of us took a decade apiece. So we had a little bit easier um, in that respect. Um, we actually narrowed it down to a list of just under 200 that we initially started with. Um, and then we, through a collaborative process, began to narrow it down from that um, with back and forth discussing the various pieces. Um, and then we also did include um, a call to um, Sabre's uh, chapter chairs, research committee chairs, asking for nominations as well. Um, and that was because one of the interesting things that was hard to sort of get a little bit of a grasp on. And we wanted to make sure that we're a lot of, sometimes there's research published in um, the newsletters of committees and things that is very substantial. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't missing. Um, and so a call went out to, and we had a number of uh, nominations come in. And it was nice to see a lot of those uh, lined up very nicely with some of the choices we made, but it was very much a collaborative process. Well, once we each sort of gave our nominations from the various decades. That's awesome. I know we have a lot of researchers in the audience who maybe were wondering if they made the cut. Uh, so if you don't find your name in the table of contents, uh, we just heard from Leslie, you were in the top 200 and that's still awfully good. Out of, out of, you were in the top 15,000 for sure. Well, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> this is, I run a feel good meeting here, John. Uh, John, while I have you here though, uh, so the, the, that table of contents has hit the street. I saw it. I saw it today uh, as part of where you could buy the book. You could review the table of contents. And so uh, the, the cat is out of the bag. Um, but let me ask you this, and you can't say all 50, but uh, is there a particular article in there that really called your name? One, one that you're just so happy to see in this book? For me, it's the very first article in the book. It's from the Baseball Research Journal of 1973. It's by Fred Lieb, uh, a, 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 an honored name in baseball history and baseball research, baseball authorship. And Fred got his first job in baseball in 1909, but he was a Sabre member in 1972 and wrote pieces for both the 72 and 73 research journals. This particular story to me sings because it's about Ernie Lanigan whose job he took at the New York Press in 1911. And Ernie Lanigan had commenced writing for the Sporting News in 1898. So for me, this is evocative of the great span of baseball that Sabre members are interested in and that Sabre membership reflects. We all connect with someone before us. Oh, phenomenal. Leslie, how about you? Is there a particular article that really calls your name? Yeah, and I have to, it sort of reflects some of my own interests, but it would have to be Jerry Malloy's um, work um, Out at Home, which came out in 1983. And for those who never had the pleasure of meeting and working with Jerry, um, Jerry was a phenomenal researcher, writer, and probably what most people would remember about Jerry is there was nobody who would share more readily his research and his expertise and his willingness to mentor other writers and things. And in his piece Out at Home, which came out in 1983, it really reflected all of those pieces because even in the groundbreaking research that Jerry did, he acknowledged all the other people who helped him and, and that was Jerry and that's Sabre. And so for me, that one really captures, I think, um, really what we're all about. And the writing is just superb. And let, let, let me echo Leslie's choice. Jerry submitted his article for the National Pastime in 1982, but it was so long that I had to say, Jerry, I'm going to put you on the shelf, but I promise you will run it in full in 83. Cool. Fantastic. Uh, I can't wait to read that. Um, okay. Well, well, I'm going to throw yet another curveball or maybe a screwball here. I'm going to take us back to 1900 and the German mathematician David Hilbert published 23 challenges known as the Hilbert problems. These were 23 unsolved problems that he hoped 20, uh, 20th century researchers might crack. So I'm looking ahead, maybe it's to Sabre 100 at, a, uh, at 100, 50 years from now. Uh, uh, the unsolved problems in baseball research or in baseball 
Uh, and I'll start with you, John. Things that, uh, based on today's presentation, we might take forward as uh, particularly thorny problems or heafy problems for the future. Let me just go with one, which is yeah. to me the great mystery of baseball. And that is why does it feel so good to play catch or have a catch in the phrasing of, I think, the Midwest? What is it about the to and fro nature of that routine backyard activity that is so fulfilling? This to me seems mysterious and fraught with troubles for researchers but this is where I'd like to go, not so much in perfecting further some of the advanced metrics that we have developed over the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah, bring it, bring it back to start. Uh, Leslie, how about you? How about you? What, what do you think of as a, a currently unsolved problem in baseball research that, that maybe in the next 50 years, a uh, researcher may crack, uh, of course, under the Sabre umbrella? Well, it's interesting that sort of John and I maybe were a little bit on the same page because for me, I had written down the idea of slightly different twists, but why does it endure as something we so love? What is it about the game? And maybe it's that, that to and fro. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. But baseball, and it's had its ups and downs, and it's gone through, and yet it's still something that we all love, and it endures all of the, and I'm very curious as to seeing and I'll be curious if that continues, and, but it certainly has to this point. And so the question really is why? Um, and then I would just add a second, because I, I just think for me, it's always interesting. There are so many still uh, un holes that have to be, that can be researched um, in so many areas. And I see those as something filling in some of the gaps um, and stories that we don't know about, whatever those stories may be. Um, and so it's not really a problem. It's just a continuing idea that we, that we need to do that. You almost brought a tear to my eye. You, you were you were sort of uh, conjuring up James Earl Jones from Field of Dreams in terms of uh, the enduring uh, power of baseball and its hold on us. Uh, okay, I love it. So let's let's do this. And I see some questions coming in, and I'd encourage audience members to continue to type some questions into the chat. But we're going to get a little bit personal here, Leslie, since I've got you on the screen. Uh, here we are, Sabre is 50 years old, but uh, talk to us about your time in Sabre and what the organization's meant to you. Sure, um, well, I, I mean, it's a simple thing to say, a great deal, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be doing what I do in many ways without the people and without the organization of Sabre because as John very eloquently a few minutes ago said about Lanigan, we stand on the shoulders of others and we get the help. Um, and I think about, you know, Jerry's assistance and things. I've been a Sabre member since 1989. I joined when I was working on my master's thesis, and that's the reason I joined. I was looking for help. <laughs> and I was working on my master's thesis on the Negro Leagues and ran across the Negro Leagues Committee. And back then, yes, I had to write a letter. <laughs> and I wrote a letter, um, and it found its way to a number of individuals. One of them I know is on the phone call on the call today. I was Larry Lester and uh, Dick Clark, a variety of others, and they welcomed me, gave me the help and support that I needed to get through my master's thesis, continued that on, and I've been a Sabre member ever since, and continue to find the organization to be one that supports and encourages, and, and, want, and I want to add my part to that because it has helped me so much um, in, in giving opportunities sharing the research that we find, that's what Sabre has been, uh, truly a, a great supportive organization. And I have enjoyed the various ups and downs and challenges and, and opportunities that it has presented for me. Wow, fantastic. Well, as much as you've gotten out of the organization, I think I would speak for uh, maybe all of membership to say you, you've given even more than you've taken. So, um, yeah, let me turn it to John, and I'm going to say, John, so John, everything he writes is beautiful. He wrote a beautiful foreword to Sabre 50 at 50, and I'm going to say, John, that maybe near the end of your foreword, you almost answered this question already, but for the folks who didn't read an early copy like me, uh, maybe share with us what Sabre's meant to you in the time you've been a part of the organization. I'm in my 40th year as a Sabre member my best friends in baseball and some of my best friends in life have come through this organization. 
And it's not merely because of the shared interest in baseball, it's because we care so deeply about things that most of the world doesn't care about. And that, that brings a unity to us. I think that my career, which has had ups and downs, and certainly I've got a position now that many Sabre members would like to take from me um, as official historian of Major League Baseball, I could not have gotten here without you and your work and the 50 articles that are in this book and the 14,000 550 or whatever the number is that didn't make it. Look, Leslie had said earlier that I took two decades and each of the other three editors took one so they had it easier. Frankly, I had it easier because I had already read everything from 1970 <laughs> to 1990. So I had a pretty good idea of what the good stuff was. And the good stuff is in Sabre, frankly, everywhere to this day. Wow, that's that is uh, the the marketing team. I think needs that for the website. The good stuff in Saber is everywhere, and 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 maybe we'll attribute it. Maybe maybe you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, wow, fantastic. A lot of questions have come in, and so if it's okay with the two of you, let's let's see uh, where we are. Jason, please unmute Leslie. Ah, well, Leslie, you, you somebody, somebody successfully took care of that for me. Thankfully. Uh, oops, I'm only seeing it now. Okay, uh, from Jeff Howard. Uh, can you elaborate on how we can get the Sabre 50 at 50 book? Do we go to Amazon? Is it somehow available through this conference? I'll, I will indicate on this. I'll take this one. Uh, Scott Bush, just a couple chats down from that, provided a link uh, that Nebraska Press uh, slash Sabre hyphen virtual slash et cetera, blah, blah, blah. That is really a great place to go because it is 40% off. Uh, and I think that extends to a number of Sabre titles. Uh, through August 15th. So I'm not trying to play favorites, but if you want to save 40%, click the link from Scott Bush. Um, but I do believe it's also available through Amazon and wherever fine books are sold, as they say. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, do check the link from Scott. And I think that's also through our website. You can find that as well. Um, okay. I think this is for each of you. John, I've got you on screen. So we'll start with you. What surprised you the most when putting this uh, volume together? What surprised me the most was how many fantastic articles were left on the floor. Yeah. This was even after we had all agreed that Bill James, Pete Palmer, Dick Kramer, uh, Keith Olbermann, no rock star of baseball was going to get two pieces. So um, we are democratic to that extent. The first article is by Fred Lee. The last one's by D.B. Firstman. And it's on three true outcomes. So uh, we do cover the, the time period. We did a pretty good job, I think, of um, covering the waterfront in terms of baseball content. Though, of course, there will be objections, just as Cub fans objected to Ken Burns' baseball. There wasn't enough Cubs. There wasn't enough Cardinals. There wasn't enough Astros, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> True. Leslie, did anything surprise you or what surprised you most? Um, for me, it was just um, the sheer breadth of material. Um, I had not read all of the pieces going all the way back to 72 until, and so I got to read a lot of things that I had not had the opportunity to do. And just the, the amazing amount of uh, research that has come out and the depth and the breadth of what is available to people was just truly um, both a surprise and inspiring, but that was the big surprise to me. Fantastic. Let me keep you on. I'm going to read a really nice comment from George Robinson. He says, I joined Sabre in 1985 after doing a story on the organization for a TV sports column I did back then. One of the things that's amazed me and thrilled me in the years since is the enormous growth of Sabre's influence in the baseball world. The historical work, particularly in terms of inclusion and diversity, and the vast impact of the metrics defies my expectations. Did either of you, Leslie and John, ever dream of such an, uh, an impact? Uh, start with you, Leslie. That Sabre would have? Um, that's, I don't know. I, I hadn't really thought about it, but probably not. Um, no one ever sort of anticipates that kind of thing. Um, but it is amazing to see 
where things have grown and where things will continue. So I have to say, um, no, I probably didn't imagine that impact. Yeah, how, how about you, John? Uh, when Bill James uh, coined sabermetrics as the term for the new analytical measures, that gave a tremendous boost to the organization's visibility as well as to its membership. It characterized the organization in a perhaps tilted way toward statistics that never accurately measure what it was Sabre members were doing. But we've spent 30 years kind of brushing that aside, saying, well, we're not really statisticians. I think we just ought to welcome it and take it in. And our connections to MLB through statistics and through historical research have increased over the last 10 years through Mark Appleman's leadership, through my connections with MLB. Um, but most of all, it's the quality of the stuff. We produce fantastic stuff. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, Perry or Perry's iPhone uh, wants to add, I'm gonna sort of jump into the middle. Thank you, Saber and Leslie for working hard to recruit women members. Our numbers have risen impressively since I and Barbara Johnson were the only women in the New York chapter. And then I'm gonna pick up a little bit uh, from Joshua Bernstein uh, echoing uh, what Perry said, first joined in 86 as a 14 year old. Wow, I think that Saber has benefited greatly since then by becoming more diverse. We still have more room for improvement, but I'm glad for where we are. Um, oh, wow, okay, Cecilia Tan, who uh, was one of our associate editors says, I feel like editing the baseball research journal, which published Fred Lieb, is like standing in the batter's box where Ruth and Gehrig stood. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Wow. <laughs> Mark, Mark Armour is uh, echoing that uh, in feeling the same way, just writing for it. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, look at chat. Look at, look at, well, maybe French. Look at chat. I don't know. If I'm a 45 year member who read things as they came out, Tell me why I should buy the book. So if somebody's already read it all, does it, what does the book do for them? John, I've got you on the screen. Save a nickel then. <laughs> Save a nickel, okay. But it makes a great gift, right? Uh, you can give it, give it to your friends. Um, yes, okay. Uh, is there a promotion code for 50 at 50? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe hope that Jacob there or Scott. Is. Yes. There is, at the Nebraska page, absolutely. Okay, okay. All right, and maybe uh, Jacob and Scott in the comments, you could clarify a little more how, uh, how folks will uh, take advantage of that. And then DB Firstman, uh, I wonder if DB only found out uh, five minutes ago, uh, but I'm totally gobsmacked and honored to be one of the 50 authors selected. It's one of my proudest moments as a baseball writer. Uh, Tom Hanrahan says, congrats, DB. Uh, a <laughs> futurist question for our panelists from Scott Bush. What format will 100 at 100 take on? I'm rooting for face to face, but I don't know, Leslie and John, if you've got something there. <laughs> if it's futuristic, it, it will be more, unfortunately, Jason, it'll be more like this because that's the direction that things are headed. And so I suspect a 100 at 100 would not be um, a book format, but something much more of a technological um, panorama of some sort, multi, multi-dimensional, I would suspect, not if, recognizable to most of us today. If the dogs can have implanted chips so that you don't lose them, well, <laughs> that's the way it will go. Fantastic. Well, we are, we are creeping up on our time limit, and I dare say there are literally 36 more messages, uh, even in the time since we started taking these, but let me end it with this. Steve Treeter says, Pre-order placed, exclamation mark. We've got 148 people on this call. I would encourage all of you to follow Steve's lead. Place that pre-order, 40% off. I don't get a commission. I'm just telling you this because it's good for you. Okay, Leslie and John, I can't thank you enough, not only for what you've done for Sabre over the years, uh, but for being a part of this panel. We're hyping up the book, and it sounds to me like you couldn't ask for a better book to carry with you everywhere you go, on the bus, at the dentist's office, late at night waiting to fall asleep, in the kitchen, it, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. You're able to mute yourself if you like and, and turn off your cameras and we're gonna transition. Thanks, Jason. Thanks.
Thank you, Jason. And thank you Too. all, all my Sabre pals who joined us here. Oh, you're welcome. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's a great crowd. Okay. In that case, uh, it's my pleasure then to, we're, ju we're just moving right on here, right? There's, there's, uh, it's like there's a pitch clock on me. Uh, it's now my pleasure to take us to the third stop on our Sunday tour of uh, Sabre Virtual. Uh, our author and researcher is Mike Halpert. Mike Halpert is a professor of economics at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. He's been a member of Sabre since 1985, and he's the co-chair of the Sabre Business of Baseball Committee and editor of its newsletter, Outside the Lines. He's published more than 60 articles on the business of baseball, and his work on the history of baseball salaries has been cited by numerous authors. He is a frequent presenter at Sabre conferences and was the 2014 recipient of Sabre's Doug Pappas Award for Best Oral Presentation. His topic today is Steal of the Century, How the Red Sox Paid the Yankees to take Babe Ruth. And so Michael, if you're able to go ahead and share your screen, turn on your video if you like, unmute yourself. And with that, I think you can jump right in. Okay, let me see if I can get this to work. Are you seeing Babe Ruth here? I am seeing you, which is the next best thing, but but we wouldn't mind Babe Ruth if you could maybe- All right, let me try this again. Share uh -huh. screen. You got the Yankees cap, right? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you don't want to see me. Let's see. Of course, this worked before. <laughs> Always. And okay, you know what? Success. You're in editing mode if you want to move to slideshow mode. Um, you see it now? Perfect. I think it's perfect. All right. So uh, as you just heard, this is going to be a story about Babe Ruth, which is setting since we are virtually in Baltimore right now. Um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the most famous, or if you're a Red Sox fan, of course, the most infamous transaction in baseball history. So if you had woken up in New York on January 6th, you would have seen this headline in the paper. You would not have seen this picture in the paper. But uh, so there we have it. Yanks buy Babe Ruth for $125,000. And then, you know, several other headlines there give you some more details about this. Today, of course, we'd be tweeting hashtag fake news because that's not actually what the price was. In fact, it would be a few weeks before all of the details of this transaction really started to flesh out. At the time, though, there were still a lot of rumors and questions about exactly what was going on here. What was the actual price that was paid? Was there another part of the deal? There was a rumor that there was another three to $400,000 that changed hands. There was a story that Babe Ruth was getting a new contract, uh, that Babe Ruth wasn't even going to report to New York. That was one of the early stories, that he loved Boston, he refused to go to New York, and he was just going to stay in Hollywood and become a movie star. In fact, at the time of the sale, he actually was in Los Angeles, and the rumor was that he was making a movie, and he was supposed to be making a movie, but it fell through. And part of the confusion of what actually happened was Babe Ruth's first movie actually did come out in 1920. Head and Home was released in September of 1920, but it wasn't actually filmed in California. In fact, it was filmed in New York during the season of 1920. And if you've seen the movie, you understand why Babe Ruth chose wisely when he went to baseball instead of Hollywood. So let's just briefly cover each of these four things here. Very quickly, the actual price, $100,000, eh, maybe. We'll get to more of that later. Uh, part of the more of that is right here. Was there another part of the deal? Yes, there was, and it was the big part of the deal. And that's actually the critical part to my story that we'll be getting to. Another important part here was Ruth's new contract. He did get a new contract. He went from a historic contract, which was one of the few multi-year contracts, to an even better contract. And of course, as we heard earlier, um, he was actually so famous, he was making more than the president at one time. So then the question, was Babe Ruth really going to quit? Eh, there's no way Babe Ruth is going to quit. Babe Ruth, as we eloquently heard from Jerry earlier, and we heard in great detail from Jane Levy in her book a couple years ago, Babe Ruth was an international celebrity. But what's important to understand is he was an international celebrity through baseball. 
and he transcended baseball. But without baseball, Babe Ruth isn't what he is today. And like I said, if you've seen Babe Ruth in the movies, you know that he wasn't going to make it as an actor. So let's go back to the beginning here to really set the stage for the story. We have to go all the way back to 1911 because this is where the story begins on how Babe Ruth actually changed teams and the Red Sox paid the Yankees to do it. So in 1911, the Taylors, father and son, Charles and John, own the Red Sox and they decide they're going to build a new ballpark. So they create a trust called the Fenway Realty Trust in which they place the land that they're going to build Fenway Park on. And eventually Fenway Park itself is actually owned by this trust company. The trust company then draws up a contract with the Red Sox to lease Fenway Park to the Red Sox for $30,000 per year. The Taylors then sell the team. And by 1913, Joseph Lannon has bought the entire team. And he's also bought part of the shares. There were a thousand shares originally in the trust. And Lannon owns some of those shares and the Taylors own some of those shares. And there are a few more people that own some shares. So by 1913 then, the Red Sox franchise is owned by Joseph Lannon. He owns part of the trust, which owns Fenway Park. The Taylors own part of the trust. A few other odd people own some shares in the trust. Enter Harry Frazee. Harry Frazee comes on the scene in 1916. He buys the Red Sox and he buys Fenway Park. So he shells out money for the Red Sox and for Fenway Park. He doesn't have enough cash to buy the whole thing. Not a big surprise. Um, you know, it's quite often that teams are bought on credit. But part of what he does is he issues a note to Joseph Lannon for $262,000. In other words, he buys the team, he buys the park, he just doesn't have enough money to do it all. So Lannon has this note and the collateral that Lannon holds against the note are his shares in Fenway Trust. So Harry Frazee owns the Red Sox. He does not yet actually own Fenway Park. What he does is he has a claim to about half of Fenway Park through the trust, but he actually owns, owes land on the amount to cover that, okay? So the stage is now set. Harry Frazee is a very wealthy and successful individual. He's big in Broadway. He puts on shows, he owns theaters. He has the Red Sox. He has half a Fenway Trust, although it's in Hawk. He also has several theaters and he owns the rights to several successful shows. What he wants, is all of the Fenway Trust so that he can then also retire his debt to Lannan. And he's also at the same time trying to buy the Harris Theater on Broadway. Harry Frazee is a very wealthy man with a lot of valuable assets, but what he needs is cash. That's what he doesn't have. And that's what Lannan wants in order to get this debt retired. By 1919, he's pressuring Frazee to pay this off at the threat of selling those shares to somebody else, in which case Frazee will then lose the opportunity to get Fenway Park. So enter Jacob Rupert. Jacob Rupert has the Yankees and he's got some liquid assets. Rupert wants Babe Ruth and he wants a pennant. And Rupert needs a new source of income because Rupert knows by mid-December that Prohibition is coming on January 19th and his brewery is not going to be as profitable anymore. So what we have now is the basis for a deal. So the elements of the deal are the Yankees get Babe Ruth, and as we know, he delivers seven pennants. The Red Sox get $100,000, payable in annual $25,000 increments at 6% interest. The first one was actually paid in December of 1919. The deal isn't announced until January. Then over the next three years, the other $25,000 will be paid one installment at a time with 6% interest on the outstanding balance. Now, that's not actually how the Red Sox got the money. Remember, Frazee wants cash. So without going into a lot of boring details, he takes those promissory notes, those promises to pay, and he discounts them at a bank. He trades them to a bank and the bank gives him the money up front. He doesn't quite get $100,000, but he gets close enough for his purposes. Harry Frazee also very importantly does get another part of that deal, a $300,000 loan from Jacob Rupert. He uses all this cash then to pay off the note held by Lannan to purchase the remainder of the Fenway Trust from the Taylors, and he closes out the deal and buys the Harris Theater. So he gets everything he wants, and so does Rupert. So it looks like a great deal. Now, as part of this loan, which connects it back to the Babe Ruth sale and connects it back to both teams, Rupert now holds the deed to Fenway Park as collateral. 
on this loan, when it's originally set up, Frazee is going to pay back only the interest each of the first five years. He's going to pay 7% interest for each of the next five years, or $21,000 a year. At the end of five years, he's going to retire the debt by paying off the $300,000. If he fails to do that, then the trust is revocable to Rupert, and Rupert now becomes the sole owner of Fenway Park to do as he wishes with it. So this is what's set up here in this deal. So let's take a look at the fine print here, because this is where we find out how the deal to get Babe Ruth is even better than we ever thought. So we're gonna take a look at those promissory notes, Babe Ruth's new contract and the loan, because all three of these parts have a fairly straightforward and simple financial aspect to them that's gonna show us some interesting math here. So the promissory notes, the Yankees gave Frazee only $25,000 in 1919. And again, they're promising to pay him off over the next three years at 6% interest. So the Yankees actually paid a total of $109,000 because even though Frazee sold off those promissory notes, the Yankees still had to pay them off. They just paid them off to the bank along with the interest. So the total cost of the Yankees to buy Babe Ruth is $109,000 or so it seems. So let's take a look at Babe Ruth. Remember, Babe Ruth had threatened to quit, had threatened to hold out. In fact, earlier in the fall, while he was still with the Red Sox, he had demanded that he get a new contract from Harry Frazee. So in, before the 1919 season, Ruth signed a three-year deal with the Red Sox for $10,000 per season. At the end of the first year, he said he wanted to renegotiate that. Now he's renegotiating with the Yankees. The Yankees actually doubled the value of that contract over the remaining two years. But when they were negotiating to buy Ruth, they suspected that Ruth was going to hold out. So part of the sale deal with Frazee and the Red Sox was if the Yankees increased Ruth's salary for the remaining two years of his contract, the Red Sox would pay half of that increase up to $5,000 per year. So the Yankees doubled Ruth's salary from ten dollars to $20,000 and collected $5,000 each year for the next two years from the Red Sox as part of that deal. So the Red Sox are paying $10,000 back to the Yankees for Babe Ruth's salary. Now, the loan, remember, the original deal was $300,000 for five years, and all Frazee is going to do during that time, in fact, all he did during those five years was pay back interest. In fact, as we know, he didn't even pay it back over five years because he didn't own the team three years later. But let's take a look at that. So the deal is finalized in May of 1920. That's when the, the $300,000 loan comes through. The Fenway Park mortgage was collateral. And Frazee is going to pay $10,500 twice each year for a total of $21,000 for each of the next five years. OK? Well, when we add all that up, the Yankees paid $109,000 for Ruth. That's the principal and the interest. The Red Sox paid back to the Yankees. $10,000 towards Babe Ruth's salary, and they also paid interest in the amount of $10,500 in 1920, $21,000 for each of the next four years, and then $10,500 in 1925. That's at the point when it should have been paid off. That would have meant that the Red Sox had paid the Yankees $115,000. The Yankees had paid the Red Sox $109,000. So the Red Sox end up giving Babe Ruth to the Yankees along with $6,000, and they end up paying the Yankees to take Babe Ruth off their hand. Now, that isn't all. First of all, the loan was not paid off in 1925. Frazee actually sold the team to Bob Quinn in 1923, and with it, the obligation to pay off the loan. So the loan is part of the Red Sox and Fenway Park here. So it becomes a, a deficit that Quinn takes on when he buys the team. So Quinn is now stuck paying off this loan, two more years at 7% interest, plus a balloon payment of $300,000. So he quickly strikes a deal with Rupert to extend the loan for another 10 years, but this time at an interest rate of 6% for the next 10 years. Quinn sold the team 10 years later to Thomas Yawkey, and at that time, Yawkey paid $300,000 to Rupert to reclaim Fenway Park. Over that period of time, Rupert collected another $144,000 in interest. So by the time all was said and done, the Yankees not only got Babe Ruth, but they got $150,000 from the Red Sox for the privilege of taking Babe Ruth off their hands. Now, 
during that time, attendance soared at Yankee Stadium. As you can see here, the Yankees had already passed up the Red Sox in attendance in 1919, but look at what happens to their attendance after Babe Ruth comes along, and look at what happens to the Red Sox attendance. So the Yankees did all right attendance-wise, and as research has shown prior, the Yankees did fantastically when it comes to earning money off of Babe Ruth. Another way to look at it, instead of thinking of the Red Sox having paid back this loan to the Yankees, we can think of these annual payments as the Red Sox paying part of Ruth's salary. If we think of it that way, this graph shows the percentage of Babe Ruth's salary that was financed by payments from the Red Sox to the Yankees. So you can see in 1921, for example, the Red Sox actually funneled 130% of Babe Ruth's salary back to the Yankees. And then for the next five years after that, they funneled at least 35%. In fact, it wasn't until 1933 that they were paying less than 20% of Babe Ruth's salary every single year while Babe Ruth destroyed the Red Sox game after game after game. So the aftermath, well, Harry Frazee was out of baseball three years later and Red Sox fans have probably never forgiven him. During the 10 years that Robert Quinn owned the Red Sox, the team lost over $400,000. Only twice during that 10 year span did the team actually make any money. In both times, it was less than $10,000. During that same time period, the Yankees earned two and a half million dollars. In the five years prior to the Roost deal, the Yankees had lost $30,000. From 1920 to 1934, we know this story. The Yankees won seven pennants, four World Series, and only finished out of the first, and never finished out of the first division, finishing as low, or finished out of the first division once, I'm sorry, lower than third place only once. The Red Sox, they finished last, last nine times, seventh place twice, and never finished out of the second division, except for one lone fourth place finish. With Ruth, they had won three World Series championships in five years. As for Ruth, he earned more than a million and a half dollars during his Yankee career, which ironically would have been just about enough. In fact, it would have been a little more than enough to buy the Red Sox when he retired if he had bought them just one year earlier. Tom Yawkey paid just less than a million and a half dollars for the Red Sox and Fenway Park, which of course he had to get out of hock first. Thank you very much. Okay. I think, can you hear me, Michael, by the way? I can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, I was on mute for a second. Uh, let me do this. Let me have you end your sharing, and then we're going to jump into the Q&A. Okay, yeah, I saw a lot of questions were coming in. Let me scroll to hopefully the right place. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think these are still from the last one. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start here. Um, we've got from Thorns One, love the hat, Mike, and then from Norm and Debbie Ginsburg, hate the cap. <laughs> ah. um, okay, let me let me see uh, what we've got here. I've got a few conversations in the chat that I think maybe aren't meant for us, but here we go. From Josh, although Ruth was already transforming into a slugger in 1919. Do you believe Ruth would have remained a part-time pitcher had he remained in Boston? Well, Ruth remained a part-time pitcher when he was in New York. He just didn't pitch very often, and he didn't pitch very much. Uh, I think it was actually in the 1930s that he pitched his last game, but there are other people who know more about Ruth's career than I do. I, I doubt it. Um, from a purely economic standpoint, he was too valuable as a hitter to waste time pitching. Yeah. Um, here we go. David Lipman had, had a few things to say. I'm going to jump to the very last one. Uh, here's some trivia for folks. Henry B. Harris of the Harris Theater, mentioned in his presentation, went down on the Titanic. Uh, his, widow, <laughs> his widow took over the theater. So. No wonder it was for sale. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Uh, now from David Lipman as well. Jo uh, well, Let's see, it's, it's addressed to Josh, but Michael, I'll throw it your way just in case. Uh, what, role, what role did Frazee's Broadway flopperoos play in this situation? Uh, actually, there's a terrific article by Dan Levitt and uh, Mark Armour that kind of lays waste to that. Uh, no, no, Nanette, 
doesn't line up with the 1916, I mean the 1919 sale of Ruth. Uh, I think it was 1923 when that play was actually produced. Uh, Frazee didn't need to sell Ruth to finance a play. Frazee needed to, needed to sell Ruth to buy a theater and also to buy Fenway Park. So he just didn't have the cash to get all the things he wanted. It's not that he was in financial dire straits. Like a lot of wealthy people, he didn't have most of his assets in liquid form. He had very little cash relative to what he wanted to buy. He had very little cash. What he really wanted was more toys. He wanted another theater and he wanted a ballpark. Okay, and then Steve Treeter, who, by the way, if there's ever, you know, for the next trivia competition, I'm going to draft him with my first round pick uh, with all he knows in the Q&A chat. He, he's sharing, moreover, Rupert's Yankees paid investors zero dividends in the 1920s, instead putting all of their profit back into the business. Meanwhile, C.A. Stoneham was bleeding the Giants treasury to cover personal expenses. Michael, is that something you can refute or, or uh, confirm and maybe give, uh, give a take on? I can confirm the lack of dividend payments by the Yankees because I have a copy of their financial records from that period of time. I've never seen the Giants financial records, so I can't verify that, but it is a story I have read and I've seen it referred to in newspapers and books. Um, I have no reason to doubt that, but I can't verify it. Okay. Uh, and, and Mark Armour, whose, whose ears are burning with his mentions uh, here. Uh, oh boy, he's taken us back to, to college accounting class. Here we go. Uh, Mark asks, don't you have to adjust for the value of the dollar to access loan costs? Uh, and then goes on to say the Red Sox got $1920, but much of their payout was in post-1929 crash dollars. Absolutely. So I did that. I have all those figures. The math comes out, the numbers are different, but the result is the same. The Yankees still end up getting more money than they paid for Ruth. Uh, I did see a comment that came through that said, I understood the math. That was kind of my goal here. I didn't want to get into net present value accounting. Uh, it's a lot, a lot more math and it will interest all of the, you know, the accounting people like myself out there. But the end result is exactly the same idea. The, again, the, the amounts are different, but the Red Sox still ended up paying a lot more to the Yankees than the Yankees paid to the Red Sox. Yeah, un unbelievable. Uh, Matt may have been saying this about the deal, but let's, let's just assume he's also saying about your presentation. Matt says, wow. Um, now, now, Bart really clarifies who the wow is for. He says, great presentation, Michael, <laughs> right? I think it was a better uh, deal than a presentation, actually. So. Uh, <laughs> all right, and then Bill, uh, Bill says, I feel like I should applaud, so I'm clapping. Uh, <laughs> Thank okay, you. Unmute, un though, please, Bill, so we can, we can uh, focus on Michael here. Uh, okay, oh, here we go, from Steve. Steve wants to know, how much did Babe's agent get? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember, but I do have those figures. It was right around 10%. So Christy Walsh did very well representing Babe Ruth. Uh, his divorce hurt him, and at the time of his death, he was broke. Mm. Yeah, he, I think this must have been the one you saw come through, David Lipman. Uh, truly outstanding research and presentation. For once, I could follow the mathematics. Uh, <laughs> he notes that the babe had a chance to be like Derek Jeter, buying his own team, right? Or maybe, maybe A-Rod and J-Lo. Well, uh, I didn't say he had a chance. <laughs> I said, hypothetically, he made enough money that he could have bought them. He also spent all that money, though, so. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Robert Kamarowski says, an outstanding presentation. And then, uh, well, here we go. Uh, Thorns1 says, Mike is always a star with his presentations. And I'll remind the audience that, uh, in fact, Mike is, or, yeah, Mike is the winner of the Doug Pappas Award for Best Oral Presentation. So, uh, all right, walking the walk and talking the talk. Uh, let's let's see. Oh wow. Okay. Uh, G or Gary Gary Grow says, is there somewhere one can get a summary of Michael's presentation? In any case, thanks much, Gary Grow. And maybe what I'll do, I'll take this one, Michael. I'll say uh, Jacob or Scott, if you're around. I know there was a website or a, a site I went to where I could grab presentations. I didn't know if that's for all Saber members, but maybe clarify there. Or if not, Michael, if somebody contacted you through the directory, are you willing to share your presentation? Sure, yeah, no problem. Okay, okay. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, Dennis, who I know, says, Mike, love the picture in the background. Uh, what, what's the scene going on there? Tell, tell us uh, what we have. It's actually a gift from Dennis. It's a picture of the first pitch of the lacrosse loggers, which is a college wood bat team in the Northwoods League here in lacrosse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If that's... I could find a nail to hang it on the wall, I'd put it behind me. So thanks, Dennis, for noticing. That's right. Both, yeah, both you, both you guys are. Uh, I think I met both of you at the Keltner chapter meeting. So you, yes, you, uh, neighbors. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Cecilia Tan is saying the Levitt Armor No No Nanette article is in Saber at fifty at fifty, isn't it? I yes, don't, it I is. Don't have, oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, good. You saved you saved me a quick glance. Uh, Let's see. Oh, and, and Mark says, yes, it is. Um, all right. Uh, David is telling us he's still clapping, it looks like. Uh, oh, goodness. Uh, Ralph C. And I think I know who Ralph C. is, who has a great book out, if, if it's uh, who I think it is. But uh, Ralph C. wants us to know that Fraser's Theater ended up being a Times Square porno house. <laughs> Can I say that? I know it's going to YouTube. I don't, okay. Uh, Jacob could edit that out if needed. Um, oh, wow, look at this. Larry Lester says, one of the best presentations ever, fast action with great graphics. Okay, Sabre future presenters, you know what Larry likes. Uh, fast action, great graphics. Okay, uh, Tara says, I'm so happy this was taped. I wanna look closer at some of those slides. Um, yes. Okay, uh, and then Steve's iPhone 6, so maybe it was Siri or maybe it was Steve, is saying if you factored in Rupert having $300,000, earning 7% and 6% interest rather than sitting in the stock market for the crash and Great Depression, I wonder if it's even a better deal. Um, in, in different research that I alluded to, a friend and I, calculated what the return would have been had the Yankees invested their money in the stock market instead of Babe Ruth and building Yankee Stadium. And they came out way ahead with the deal they made. And that was before we found a copy of the deed to Fenway Park and the history of all that transfer and that it was an even better deal. Okay. So yeah, being in the stock market from 1929 to 1935 wasn't good. No. Okay. So we're, we're, closing in on the end, but we'll, we'll do a few. We'll kind of go speed round here. Um, Mark Armour, who I know is a, a Boston fan, he says all is forgiven. I guess he's <laughs> okay with the old Babe Ruth thing. Um, got a couple rings out of it anyways from the Boston days, but uh, Marlene Vogel saying there have been great images in the presentations so far. She's probably not talking about my slide, but uh, but but yours and, and uh, Jerry's. Let's see, maybe I'm seeing them better virtually than I would have in the meeting rooms. Okay. Uh, let's see, uh, we've got some promo code stuff with Nebraska. Uh, Cecilia wanted to know the painting behind you, but we covered that. Oh, how did Frazee earn his wealth before buying the Red Sox? Um, he was a, a Broadway theater magnate. So he, he produced several successful plays, owned a number of theaters. He made a lot of money that way, but I'm going to point you to the Levitt and Armoire article in 50 for 50 to get more details because they covered Frazee's life better than I do. Fantastic. I want to say thank you to Jacob who let everybody know this was related to can we get the slides. The video recording will be posted on YouTube tomorrow. We'll also be posting some of the PowerPoint slides afterwards and he gives a link so you'll see that as, as one of the last comments in the chat. Uh, and uh, David, I guess, builds on on the fate of uh, the, last, the last one we mentioned. Many of those Times Square theaters did uh, become uh, porno theaters, evidently. So, uh, right. So uh, New York got their, their porno theaters, but Sabre members get their promo codes uh, <laughs> to buy books at University of Nebraska. We will close it with Dennis Dagenhart of uh, Picture Gifting Fame with great presentation. Thanks, Mike. So, Mike, if you want to just say bye to the Sabre audience and then you can... Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciated the opportunity. I love okay. the presentations. This is great. Oh, fantastic job. So, okay, you can put yourself on mute and go off camera if you like. And then I am getting ready to find which page I'm on. Yes, and introduce our cleanup hitter today. Um, he is not well, explicitly 
presenting on Babe Ruth, but you'll see actually uh, there's some tie-ins there. So uh, let me introduce Herm Krabenhoff. His title is Day In, Day Out, Double Duty, Diamond Deers. That's a lot of Ds. And Herb Krabenhoff, a Sabre member since 1981, began the research given in his Double Duty, Diamond Deers presentation more than 60 years ago. That could be a Sabre record. In 1956, for a sixth grade term paper addressing a claim that minor league pitchers were better hitters than major league pitchers. At that time, he wrote to Commissioner Ford Frick asking for some relevant information. Mr. Frick kindly sent him a complimentary copy of the 1956 edition of the Sporting News Baseball Guide, which Herm still has and uses. I, I will say with day in, day out, double duty, Diamond Deers and Ford Frick, I feel like you guys are kind of messing with me with these tongue twisters, <laughs> hoping I accidentally say something I shouldn't. So Herman, I can see you. I think I can hear you. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen. Uh, I think you're ready to roll. All right. And uh, I can hear you just fine. You nailed it. Super. Uh, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'd put okay, great. Here, but, well, yeah. let's start. Uh, so um, what do these six players have in common? Bob Burkowski, Bob Trice, Dick Hall, Paul Pettit, Red Murph and Von McDaniel. We'll find out as we uh, go through my presentation. Uh, first of all, thank everyone for uh, participating in my presentation, which is day in, day out, double duty, diamond deers, an alliterative way of saying full-time two-way players. Uh, this session is uh, devoted to Babe Ruth, so let's start off with something about Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was, in 1918 and 1919, the last full-time two-way player in the major leagues. In the major leagues. What about the minor leagues? Well, I've done some research to address that question, and that's what I'll be talking about today. For my presentation, I'm going to focus on the 15-year period from 1946 through 1960. 1946 was chosen because it was the first year after the end of World War II in 1945. 1960 was selected because it was the last season before Major League Baseball began its expansion beyond 16 teams in 1961. Now the first order of business is to establish what constitutes a day in, day out, double duty diamond deer. Initially I thought the, uh, the, the, the simplest way would be to use the official rules for ranking pitchers and ranking batters. That is earn run average for pitchers and batting average for batters. The current rules for qualifying, for a player to qualify for the earn run average title is that he must have uh, one inning pitched per team game. Or if you convert it to a percentage basis, his innings pitch percentage, as shown in the equation below, must be greater than or equal to 100. For a player to qualify for the batting average crown, he must have accumulated 3.1 plate appearances per team game or in the percentage basis, uh, it would be plate appearances percentage greater than or equal to 100. Now, these rules have been in effect since the 1950s and therefore uh, did not uh, apply to Babe Ruth back in 1918 and 1919. But let's just see how Babe Ruth would stack up uh, to these rules. In 1918, you can see that Babe Ruth was a full-time pitcher. His innings pitch percentage was 132 but he was not a full-time pitcher in 1919. His innings pitched were percentage was 96, 4% shy of the 100% requirement. He was a full-time batter, however, in 1919. His plate appearance percentage was 129, but he was not a full-time batter in 1918. His plate appearance percentage was 97, 3% short of the required 100. So the bottom line, technically speaking, is that in 1918 and 1919, Babe Ruth was not a bona fide day in, day out, double duty diamond deer. But we all know that he was a full-time two-way player in both of those seasons. So therefore I had to lower the bar. I reduced my first pass requirements by 10%. So going forward, a, to, for a player to be re regarded as a day in, day out pitcher, his innings pitch percentage 
must be greater than or equal to 90. And to be regarded as a day in, day out batter, his plate appearance percentage must be greater than or equal to 90. With these guidelines in place, I then proceeded to go through the Sporting News baseball uh, guides for the 1946 through 1960 seasons, going through, looking at every minor league from AAA through D to ascertain which players were day in, day out, double duty diamond ears. And the overall results are shown on the next slide. I found, that, found out that there were 60 day in, day out, double, du double duty diamond ears and that there were 76 day in, day out, double duty seasons. So some players had more than one day in, day out, double, du double duty seasons. Let's look at some specifics. I'm gonna focus on seven topics uh, today. Double, uh, double duty diamond years who were top pitchers, top batters, top fielders, top base runners, a composite all-star lineup, player managers, and finally, those uh, 5D players who played in the majors. Let's start with the top pitchers first. In table 1A, I list the uh, day in, day out, double duty diamond ears who led their league in lowest earned run average. There are nine of them here. Herb Moore, Charles Allen, Paul Bruno, Merrill Hogue, Robert McGimsey, Eddie Carnett, Lee Tunnison, Perry Roberts, and Dick Hall. Before I began my research, I was aware of only two of these players, Merrill Hogue and Dick Hall. If you look at the fourth column, the league level column, you'll see that most of these players, all but one of these players, played in the low minor leagues, classes C and D. The lone exception was Dick Hall, who played for the Western League, a class A league, in 1955. Note also that Merrill Hogue's name is bracketed with asterisks. That's uh, to uh, uh, remind me to tell you that he's also a top batter, shown in chart 2A. But before we get to chart 2A, let's take a look at a picture of Dick Hall. This picture of Dick Hall is from his 1955 Topps baseball card. It's his so-called rookie card, although he actually made his major league debut in 1952. If you look on the card at the bottom, the, the red line there, it shows that he, uh, his position is third base outfield. And that the, if you look at the inset picture, you'll see he's in a batting pose. The fact is, uh, Dick Hall began the 1955 season with Lincoln in the Western League, uh, and he both pitched and played the outfield. And his, uh, his stat line for, uh, uh, with uh, Wichita is shown at the top, his one loss record, ERA, and his batting slash line. In uh, late July, he was called up by the Pittsburgh Pirates, and. Uh, remained with them for the rest of the season, and he, but he was essentially a pitcher-only player with the Pirates, and that's also the case for the rest of his professional baseball career. Okay, let's now move on to the, the top batters. Merrill Hogue was the Florida State leading, Florida, Florida State League leading batter in 1947, and if you remember from the chart 1A, he was also the earned run average leader for the Florida State League in 1947. So as a double duty player, he topped the pitchers and the batters in performance. Quite a, quite a feat. Three other players uh, were batting champions among the uh, day in, day out double duty diamond ears, Roy Sanner, Fred Campbell, and Joe Roseberry. Now, Roy Sanner's name is bracketed with asterisks. That's because he's on the next chart. Roy Sander was one of two players to lead their league in home runs among the 5D players. Lou Baville was the other. Note also that Roy Sander's name is again bracketed with asterisks. And that's because he is again on the next chart. In 1948, Roy Sander led the Evangeline League in batting average, home runs, and RBIs. Roy Sander won the triple crown in batting. That's a feat regardless of whether you're a, 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 a two-time, a, a, a two-way player or not. The question then is, how did he do as a pitcher? Pretty well. As a pitcher, he finished second in wins, 21 versus 22, second in strikeouts, 251 versus 259, and second in earned run average, 2.58 versus 2.37. He finished second 
indeed a close second in each of the three pitching categories that define the pitching triple crown. Pretty good, not pretty good combination. Winning the triple crown in batting and coming in second in, uh, in triple crown in pitching. He did finish first in winning percentage, one of five pitchers to achieve that feat. And they're shown on, the next, on this chart. Three of these pitchers uh, were also on the ERA leaders chart, Herb Moore, Merrill Hogue, and Perry Roberts. Also shown on this chart is Bob Trice. Now I mentioned that Roy Center came in a close second for the winning the pitching triple crown. One might ask, were there any day in day out double duty diamond ears who won the pitching triple crown? And the answer is yes, there were. And we'll get to them in just a moment, but first here's a picture of Bob Trice. This picture of Bob Trice is from his 1954 Topps baseball card. It's also his rookie card. Although he made his major league debut in 1953 at the tail end of the season. He spent most of the 53 season with uh, Ottawa in the AAA International League, where he uh, ended up being the rookie of the year and the most valuable player in the International League. Uh, he was a pitcher only uh, with uh, Ottawa in 1953. In 52, the stats shown there are for his, uh, his day in, day out double duty season. Prior to 1952, uh, Bob Trice uh, was a pitcher for the Homestead Drays from 19, late 1948 to mid-1950. Okay, now let's look at the Triple Crown winners in pitching. There were two of them, Paul Bruno and Lee Tunnison. How did they do as batters? Lee Tunnison did adequate. He um, uh, batted 272 and hit eight home runs. Paul Bruno, he did phenomenally well. He uh, batted 332, which placed fourth in, uh, in the uh, Evangeline League. His on-base average was 434, second in the league. And he was first in slugging with a 563 mark. He was also second in home runs. So another good combination of pitching and batting together by a day-in, day-out double D diamond deer. In addition, he finished second in fielding among first basemen in the Evangeline League, his fielding average being just one point lower than the, the winner. Speaking of fielding, let's look at the top fielders among catchers, infielders, and outfielders. Bob Workowski, Stan Karpinski, Hack Miller, Robert Benish, Stanley Golitz, Lou Beville, Benny Warren, and Wilbur Caldwell. Note that each of these players uh, played in the low minor leagues, classes C and D. Note also that, that uh, Robert Benish compiled the highest fielding average among pitchers, a perfect 1,000. He was one uh, one of eight uh, day in day out double duty diamond ears to achieve that perfect fielding mark uh, as, a, as a pitcher. We'll get to that list in just a moment, but first here's a picture of Bob Borkowski. This picture of Bob Borkowski is from his 1953 Topps baseball card. He had made his major league debut in 1950 with the Chicago Cubs and in 1946 with the Appalachian, in the Appalachian League he led the league in fielding percentage among the outfielders. He also did pretty well as a pitcher. 18-9-1 loss record, and his batting slash line of 384, 417, 589, also pretty good. In fact, his 384 batting average and 589 slugging percentage ranked second in the Appalachian League in 1946. All right, now let's get to the, the top fielding pitchers, those with uh, 1,000 fielding percentage averages. One, yeah, uh, Robert Benish, John Farkas, Al Gardella, Perry Roberts, Sam Lamatina. Roy Sinkfield, Juan Izagari, and Harold Hacker. Notice again, all these players are from the low levels of the minor leagues, classes C and D. The next topic on the agenda is base running. Turns out there were two uh, day in, day out double duty diamond ears who led their league in stolen bases, Wilbur Caldwell and John Bona. Okay, so thus far we've uh, 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 covered many parts of the diamond. We've covered the, the pitcher's mound, the batting box, batter's box, the infield, the outfield, and the base pass. That led me uh, to wonder, could one put together an all-star lineup of day in, day out, double duty diamond ears? Well, here's my attempt to do so. For my infield, I have at first base, Paul Bruno, Bama Rowell is my key stoner, Jesse Cade is my hot, hot corner man, Fred Campbell plays shortstop. My fly hawks are Meryl Hogue, Lou Baville, and James Warren. And my battery, I have Benny Warren as the catcher, Lee Tunnison as my right-handed pitcher, and Roy Sander as my southpaw hurler. 
And as a utility fielder uh, player, I have Von McDaniel. You'll note that many of these players have stars bracketing their names. That's because they were chosen as all-stars for, uh, for their league uh, in, the, in, the, in the season given and the position stated. Paul Bruno, Bama Rowell, Jesse, Jesse Cade, Meryl Hogue, James Warren, Benny Warren, Lee Tunnison, and Von McDaniel. The next topic on the agenda are, is player managers. There were 12 day, day in, day out, double duty diamond ears who were also player managers. We're gonna get to those in just a moment, but first, here's a picture of Von McDaniel. This picture of Von McDaniel is from his 1958 Topps baseball card. It's his rookie, rookie card, although he made his major league debut in 1957. In 1959, he was a, a utility player uh, in, the, uh, in the minor leagues, and uh, he played in 104 games, 20 as a pitcher, 22 as a first baseman, shortstop 19, and outfield 16. His uh, one loss record and his batting record show that he was uh, certainly deserved being a utility all-star player. Okay, now we're going to player managers. Because these players uh, pitch, bat, and also manage, I have termed them triple duty diamond deers. There were 12 of them. Here are the first six. Herb Moore, Al Barilari, Hack Miller, Bob Benish, Meryl Hogue, and Woody Wheaton. Note that uh, Meryl Hogue's uh, uh, second place finish is bracketed with asterisk. That's because he guided his uh, Gainesville G-men to the Florida State League Championship in the end of the season postseason playoffs. The next chart gives us the next six players, led, uh, led by uh, Paul Bruno, followed by George Washburn, Al Gardella, Benny Warren, Sam Lamatina, and Bama Rowell. Paul Bruno uh, piloted his Hammond Berries to the Evangeline League Championship in 1947 in the end of the season playoffs. Three of these triple duty Diamond Deers guided their teams to first place finishes in the regular season. George Washburn in 1949, Benny Warren in 1951, and Sam Lamatina in 1952. Okay, we're now at the home stretch. Those players, those day in, day out, double duty players who played in the major leagues. There were 17 of them. 11 are shown on the next chart. Let's see. Right here. Uh, each of these 11 players made his major league debut before 1946 before 1946. Meryl Hogue, Bama Rowell, Benny Warren, Eddie Carnett, George Washburn, Stan Goletz, Lou Baville, Woody Wheaton, Tommy Warren, Hack Miller, and Al Gardella. Only two of these players played in the majors after 1946, Bama Rowell and Benny Warren. Only three of these players accumulated over a thousand plate appearances in the major leagues. Meryl Hogue, Bama Rowell, and Benny Warren. None of these players accumulated 70 innings pitched in the major leagues. Basically, these, each of these players was a replacement player during World War II. But they did play in the minors after, after World War II. And they did so as day in, day out, double duty Diamond Deers. The next chart gives the other six players, th those who made their major league debut after 1946, Bob Borkowski, Paul Pettit, Dick Hall, Bob Trice, Red Murph, and Von McDaniel. These are the six players for whom I showed pictures of their top baseball cards uh, at the beginning of my presentation. Bob Borkowski played in the major leagues for six years from 1950 through 55. He's the only player on this list to have accumulated over a thousand plate appearances. He's the only player on this list to have not pitched in the major leagues. Paul Pettit had a very brief major league career, only four games, as all as a pitcher in 1951 and 1953. His one loss record was one and two. And his 5D season was in 1954, after his major league career had been, uh, had been completed. Uh, not, not that he, he was hoping, of course, he could uh, continue up, but he never did. Dick Hall had a uh, long major league career, 19 seasons during the period from 1952 to 1971 primarily as a relief hurler with the Baltimore Orioles. He was uh, on two of their World Series winning championship teams. Bob Trice played in the major leagues in three different seasons, 1953 at the tail end, 
1954 the entire season, and 1955 uh, a few games in the beginning of the season. In 1954, he was a, the number four starter on the Philadelphia Athletics. He turned in a seven and eight one loss record. But more importantly, he was the number one hitting pitcher among full-time pitchers in the American League. He led full-time pitchers in the American League in hitting, in batting, in batting average, on base average, and slugging percentage. And in the, for the major league pitchers, he topped them all in on base plus slugging. Red Murph was a major league pitcher for two years, uh, parts of two years, 1956, 1957, with the Milwaukee Braves. He compiled a 1 2 loss 2 record, and his 5 D season was in 1950 with Baton Rouge in the Evangeline League. Bob McDaniel, as I mentioned, broke into the major leagues in 1957 right after his high school graduation. He began uh, by hurling 19 consecutive scoreless innings and ended up with a 7 5 major league one loss record. And his 5 D season was uh, as a utility player, utility all star, was in 1959. All right, well, that uh, pretty much concludes uh, what I wanted to say, the seven topics I wanted to discuss. Uh, there were, in fact, 60, 60, major, uh, 60 players who were day in, day out, double duty Diamond Deers during the period from 1946 to 1960. Three of them were, I think, of, of special note, and I want to leave you with, with them right now. Merrill Hogue in 1947 in the Florida State League. He was the batting average leader and the earned run average leader. 1947 also was Paul Bruno's uh, uh, big year in the Evangeline League. He won the pitching triple crown and did extraordinarily well as a batter. Moreover, Merrill Hogue and Paul Bruno were both triple duty diamond deers in 1947 and guided their teams to, the, uh, to their league championships. And lastly, Roy Sander in 1948 won the triple crown in batting and came in a close second in each of the triple, uh, pitching triple crown categories. Uh, the only caveat that one could add about these uh, impressive seasons is that they were each achieved in the low minors, the low level minor leagues, level class level D. So I thank you so very much, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. And let me, I guess I stop share now. Is that right? Am I all right? Yeah, you did perfect. You did perfect. Um, fantastic presentation. I saw a lot of comments go in the chat. A lot of them were sharing additional trivia on these players and others. A lot of them, I think, are planning the party for next year, it looked like. <laughs> but let's, uh, yeah, let's see. <laughs> Let me just try to pick up where, okay. uh, where the last one ended and this one started. Uh, okay, let's, let's, oh, great job, Jason. Thanks for hosting. I'm going to take that one. Thanks for hosting today. I appreciate it, Scott. Uh, okay, we've got some, some party stuff. And then uh, look at this from Michael Halpert, your co-presenter today. Herm never ceases to amaze me with new and fascinating information. Thanks, so, Michael. Yeah, outstanding. Um, here we go uh, from David Lippman. Wasn't Dick Hall a Phi Beta Kappa? Um, I don't know that. I know that he did, uh, he did go to college and uh, I think became an accountant or something after, after his uh, career. It's in the Sabre uh, bio. So yes. Whoever yeah, wrote the Sabre bio, bio mentioned that. Yeah, Alan Cohen chips in and notes that Hall was from Swarthmore, uh, he believes, and became an accountant. So, uh, okay, let's let's see. Uh, okay, just some things on the format in general. Uh, David Alvarex is asking, not the Roy Sanner. <laughs> well, <laughs> I only know of one. Yeah. Uh, and that's the one whom, uh, of whom I spoke. I, I knew of zero 23 minutes ago, so I, I can't help on that one either. Um, but let's see, this, this format with these presentations, this is Steve Steinberg, uh, is triggering some very cool out of the box thinking. So fantastic. Uh, uh, more, more on Hall, by the way. Hall's last MLB start was the only time, this is from Neil Traven, that Neil saw the Phillies win a game at Connie Mack. So Hall <laughs> apparently won the game, throwing a complete game. Uh, we don't know how many games Neil went to. Hopefully it wasn't like 30 or anything, right? But, um, but at any rate, that was the only win. Uh, wow. Okay, let's see from Steve Treater. This is great. I love these low minor league superstars of this era. Really fun stuff. Um, Thanks. Yeah. 
Okay, here we go. This is on Sanner from George Robinson. Did Sanner ever make the bigs? Those 48 numbers were surreal. No, he never did. Neither did uh, Paul Bruno. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, Muriel Hogue was a teammate of Babe Ruth. And, uh, but his, he, uh, Muriel Hogue achieved his um, uh, uh, great season after he was done as a major leaguer. P uh, Paul Bruno and, uh, 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 and Roy Sanner uh, could never even trans transition their, their, their D-level stats to higher levels in the, major, in the minors, and neither one of them made it to the major leagues. Okay, well, you, you have stirred quite an interest in Dick Hall, and Cecilia Tan is, is ready for all of Dick Hall's newfound fans uh, on the Dick Hall bandwagon to know, coming to all members by the end of the month, the National Pastime Journal, themed to Baltimore, will have an extensive article about Dick Hall by oh, Tom cool. Mancini. So yeah, we can't get enough Dick Hall, uh, and here we go. Uh, David Lippman says, thanks, Cecilia. Favorite magazine, never throw mine out. Okay. Oh, boy. Here's where it gets a little crazy. Uh, David Alvarex lets us know that Bob Trice was from Thrace in Greece. Trice lived thrice in Thrace. <laughs> and then David Lippman says, Trice was from Greece. How did that happen? Now we need a Sabre Bob Trice chapter in Athens. And then David Alvarex, I'm, I'm, I'm going, it's a little bit of this is joking, but it gets pretty good. Uh, David clarifies, Trice, not from Greece, it was a joke. But then here we go, let me, let me I just have to, uh, let me see, <laughs> can I find this? Well, before we continue on the, on the Trice, and it will be worth it, uh, we see a note here from, uh, it looks like Victor Piacentile, maybe. Uh, Hogue was 39 years old in 1947. How did he manage to put together such a great season at any level at that age? Yeah, it's, I'm amazed at that myself. Uh, uh, he was, uh, even in 1946, uh, uh, he was uh, a pitcher batter, uh, more batter than pitcher, and he led the league in home runs in 1946. So, uh, I'm amazed that my I'm amazed myself that he was still able to do that. Uh, he was not a, uh, a a star baseball player in the major leagues. I mean, he did play and he was on the World Series teams with the Yankees. But uh, uh, yeah, well, let's let's see. Well, I'm going to race through a few. There, there's a note that Vaughn McDaniel was Lindy's brother. That's correct. Uh, from David Lippman, uh, Steve Steinberg notes that Vaughn McDaniel card you showed was one of the first he ever got, and then memories dot dot dot. Steve, we need you at the Baseball Card Blog. Uh, let's see, Merrill Hogue is the great uncle of the Stassi brothers, just a fun fact from David Espinosa. Wow. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, oh, from Bill, how did Sanner not get chosen as an all-star in 1948? And the answer, a very simple answer, the uh, Evangeline League did not choose an all-star team in 48. Had, had they chosen one, he certainly would have been an all-star, if not as a batter, then, then as a pitcher. But that, yeah, uh, they, they, there was no Evangeline League All-Star team in 1948. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Dick Wood notes that Red Murph, who you highlighted, was the scout uh, who signed Nolan Ryan to the Mets in 19. That's right, too. I knew that, yes. Okay, now here we go from David Alvarex. You mean Bob Trice played in the MLB thrice? I was right after all, referring to those three seasons. And then... <laughs> Kathy Garber, get ready to groan. So you were right twice about Trice thrice? Oh boy, okay. Um, <laughs> I love the alliterations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Uh, Michael Halpert wonders how many such players toiled in the Negro Leagues, right? Maybe Double Duty Ratcliffe, but, but many others. Um, um, uh... I'm not certain. I only, I only, I can only recall Bob Trice right now uh, of being of, of qualifying under my guidelines. You know, the 90% uh, uh, innings pitch percentage or, or uh, plate appearance percentage. Yeah, fan fantastic. And there were, I mean, that one I think is asking you to do a part two on Negro Leagues. I saw other comments that were suggesting other eras, including all the way to present day, would be fantastic. So looking at the clock, let me do this. Um, Herm, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, what I'll do now is just I, I have a little closing for everybody. I just want to say thank you all for attending Sabre Virtual. It makes me sad, but this is the end 
of our Sunday program. Today's presentations will be posted online at Saver's YouTube channel afterward. If you want to go back and watch them again, I will. You can find the complete schedule or register to attend the remaining Saver virtual sessions on our website at saver.org, our brand new website. Thank you again, and we'll see you Thursday, July 16th. Okay. Do I, ask, uh, do I end my share screen now? What do uh, I do? Can. Yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm going to just I'm gonna leave. End the whole meeting for everybody. I'm going to blow okay. it. It's just going to go away. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm going to leave now. Bye now. Hey, okay. And everybody in the audience, you've been a great audience. Thanks. And, and the technical support has arrived. It's okay to hang up uh, on Herm. We're good. Okay. Take it easy, everybody.